Bibles to Colossians chapter 4. Colossians 4 will be our text this morning. Sunday after Thanksgiving is always a particular challenge, isn't it? Some of you are still full of turkey and stuffing and and what is it, tryptophan? Is that the stuff that makes you, you sleepy? So I will try to use as many gestures as possible to keep you linked in and interested. In Colossians chapter 4, Lord willing, we will finish the exposition of this book. I always get a little sad when I'm about to finish preaching through a book. It's almost like I'm losing a friend. It's a very weird experience for me. The book of Colossians has been my daily meditation for well over a year now. I've thought about this book every day, and I've tried to give you everything I can in terms of understanding this book and bringing some of these things to light. Now, that's one of the great benefits of consecutive expository preaching. We go from one verse to the next verse to the next verse and squeeze as much truth as we can out of it. But who knows, this could be the very last time I ever preach the book of Colossians, and that always makes me a little sad. Now, before we get to the text, though, let me encourage you to pick up one of these books on your way out. The church bought a whole bunch of these books, and uh, this book is called Magnify the Lord by Martin Lloyd-Jones. Now, Martin Lloyd-Jones is one of my very favorite dead preachers. And I, I've made no bones about the fact that over the last year, I've been trying to, and I will continue to try, to teach you to love these dead preachers. Well, the next step in, in my maniacal plan is to encourage you to read this book. This is, I think, four, if I'm not mistaken, four Christmas sermons. Yeah, four Christmas sermons by Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. And it'll be a real blessing to you in, in the next few weeks as we prepare to celebrate the Lord's birth at Christmas. Now, starting next Sunday, I will be preaching a series called My Soul Magnifies the Lord. It is in no way based on this book, but it is based on the text that this book is based on. And so let me encourage you to do that. Seventeen sermons in the book of Colossians on the hope of glory. Hasn't it gone quickly? If you don't think so, don't tell me. It'll hurt my feelings. But hasn't it gone quickly? Only 17 sermons in this magnificent book? This week we will be talking about teamwork and the hope of glory. And this will be our conclusion to the book. So let's read our text. Starting in chapter 4, verse 7, it says this, as to all my affairs, Tychicus, our beloved brother and faithful servant and fellow bond servant in the Lord, will bring you information. For I have sent him to you for this very purpose, that you may know about our circumstances and that he may encourage your hearts. And with him, Onesimus, our faithful and beloved brother, who is one of your number, they will inform you about the whole situation here. Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, sends you his greetings, and also Barnabas' cousin Mark, about whom you received instructions. If he comes to you, welcome him. And also Jesus, who is called Justice. These are the only fellow workers for the kingdom of God who are from the circumcision, and they have proved to be an encouragement to me. Epaphras, who is one of your number, a bond slave of Jesus Christ, sends you his greetings always laboring earnestly for you in his prayers that you may stand perfect and fully assured in the will of God. For I testify for him that he has a deep concern for you and for those who are in Laodicea and Hierapolis. Luke, the beloved physician, sends you his greetings as also Demas. Greet the brethren who are in Laodicea and also Nympha and the church that is in her house. When this letter is read among you, have it also read in the church of the Laodiceans. And you, for your part, read my letter that is coming from Laodicea. Say to Archippus, take heed to the ministry which you have received in the Lord that you may fulfill it. I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. Remember my imprisonment. Grace be with you. I want to remind you of what the hope of glory means 
This whole series has been called affectionately the hope of glory. What is it that we're looking to? What is it that we're trying to accomplish? Well, in Colossians 1.27, it says this, to whom God willed to make known what is the riches of his glory in this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. The book of Colossians is written to assure you that if you have Christ in you, that your hope of glory is absolutely certain. The hope of glory is the absolute assurance on the part of the believer by virtue of the person and work of Jesus Christ that his eager anticipation of inheriting eternal life in heaven will be truly and definitely realized. I want to remind you of what this 17 sermon undertaking was meant to accomplish. And secondly, I want to express to you how grateful I am to be called to this purpose and to this place. I've been very blessed by you, the congregation. You are, among other things, what I was giving thanks for on Thursday. Even those of you who can't be with us today, that are watching us, you matter to us. We love you and we appreciate you. We haven't forgotten about you. I also have been very blessed by this whole ministry team in the office. It is amazing how hard they work and, and with what great attitude they work. It's been really fun to be a part of this group. You may think that I have absolutely no idea what's going on half the time, and you'd be right. I have no idea what's going on, but they do. It's fantastic. I've been very blessed by the elder team and working together as a team to accomplish common goals. And I've been very blessed by my fellow pastors. So let's get then to teamwork and the hope of glory. The Apostle Paul is unquestionably one of the most influential human beings in history. Cannot be debated. It is a simple fact. Even if you don't believe what he believes, even if you don't accept the books that he has written, it is impossible to argue that the Apostle Paul has not made a great impact on human history. So for those of us who believe what God spoke through him, those of us who cherish what God wrote through him, we have to understand that the Apostle Paul is one of the most influential people in human history. But when was the last time you praised God for Tychicus? How many Tychicus fans do we have here today? Tychicusonians. I don't even know what you would be called. Nobody even thinks about Tychicus. By the way, if you are with child and want to find a great name for your child, <laughs> I recommend Tychicus. I don't. I don't. The Apostle Paul was so instrumental in human history, but we forget sometimes that he worked with others as part of a team so much so that in almost every letter he wrote by God's inspiration, he includes specific people that he wants to give a shout out to. Not simply to inflate their ego, but to remind them that teamwork gets it done. I'm tempted to say teamwork makes the dream work, but I hate that kind of stuff, so I won't say that. Nobody is an island, not even the Apostle Paul, the great New Testament author and apostle was an island. Now, notice how he approaches the end of his book. He mentions people and just sends them a message to tell them that he still knows they exist, that he still cares about them, that, that he values their contribution to the work singular that all servants of Christ are part of. And the first thing he gives us is this, a mention 
of multiple messengers. See, it would be real easy to think your favorite TV preacher or your favorite online celebrity preacher, your favorite Christian author just sits by himself and creates all these things without any help, without any support, just simply by their own giftedness. And you would be wrong. Christian work is done corporately. It's done as a team. And the measure of our success going forward will not simply be what results one person gets. It'll be the results that God gives all of us. I want to encourage you along those lines and and challenge you along those lines this morning. Notice what we find here. As we ask the question, how does Paul describe his fellow workers? I love this. Look at verse 7. As to all my affairs, Tychicus, our beloved brother and faithful servant and fellow bond slave in the Lord, will bring you information. Notice what he says. He describes Tychicus as a beloved brother. That's not by accident. What he's saying is simply this. While we work together side by side in the cause of the gospel, Paul says to Tychicus, you were not some nameless underling that did what I said. You aren't some stranger to me. You are my beloved brother. You are the object of my affections and my equal in my eyes. That's why I selected Philippians 1, verse 3. I love this passage. He says this, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you. And then he skips down in verse 7. He says, it's only right for me to feel this way because I have you in my heart. That's how we should feel toward one another in the church and in the work of Christian ministry. Let me ask you, do you feel that way? Or are we filled with Lone Ranger Christians? Remember that show, Lone Ranger? It's way before my time. Way, way before my time. But there was this guy named the Lone Ranger. But he wasn't alone. He had a sidekick. Remember that? That always confused me. He's the almost alone Ranger. (laughs) Is your walk, is your contribution, is your life strictly individual? Or are you a part of something? Are you a beloved brother? We need to remember that those with whom we serve are supposed to be the objects of our affection. And Christian ministry that makes the people around them feel bad fails. And so I hope over the last year, you've been encouraged to walk along with me. I hope never to take the tone of being higher than you. You are my beloved brothers and sisters. Like Tychicus. We share in the hope of glory together. And if nothing else, this should endear us to one another. Now notice what he goes on to say in verse 7. As to all my affairs, Tychicus, our beloved brother and faithful servant. Now, I put these other words beside the word servant in this verse because two different Greek words are used. In the first one, it's faithful diakonos. So we get the word deacon from this. One who serves. The other one is a fellow slave, sundulas. So what is he saying here? He's saying that the Christian ministry done together as a team requires faithfulness and service. Sharing the load and doing the work, putting in the time. We need to remember that those with whom we serve are called just as we are and must serve their master just as we do. We should appreciate and praise God for the faithful service of others. 
Do we? Or are we competitive? I tell you, one of the hardest things for me, confessing sin here, is to be in church when somebody else is preaching. Because I can get a little critical. I always tell people this, if it goes bad, I feel bad. And if it goes great, I feel worse. Because I'm full of pride and a critical heart. It's hard. But Paul calls Tychicus not only a beloved brother, but a faithful server. The object, is of, the object of his affections and his fellow laborer. And the last thing he calls him here is a fellow slave. This is one word in Greek, sundulas. It means slave together. Now, I know why most modern translations don't translate this slave. It has a very negative connotation. I get that. But the picture Paul is painting for us is not just what he calls somebody else, but what he calls himself. And let me illustrate the difference. If I were to come up to you and say, slave, do this for me, will you? You're going to react one way. But if I say, oh, beloved fellow slave, can you help me in this? That's totally different. In fact, husbands, try this at home. (laughs) No. Paul, in calling Tychicus a fellow slave, is calling himself a slave. Slaves do what their master tells them to do. They don't puff their chest out and demand that the master follow them. Paul puts himself amongst a team. And he says, I'm one of them, and I love them, and they're faithful. And we see this for the rest of the chapter. In verse 9, we see this. For those of you who already named one child Tychicus, we get another one in verse 9. And with him, Onesimus, our faithful and beloved brother. You see it again? Faithful and beloved, who's one of, our, one of your number. They will inform you. They'll do the work. They'll bring it to you. And if you have three children, in verse 10, Aristarchus. My fellow, see that? Prisoner sends you his greetings. Paul shares with them, I did not do this alone. So when you thank me, Paul says, when you benefit from my ministry, Paul says, know that you are benefiting from the ministry of countless people you'll never meet. That's awesome. He goes from a mention of multiple messengers to gracious greetings. Now, it's interesting. You'll see in this text that the word greet happens over and over again. It's the Greek word aspazomai. And all it means is to greet. But the reason why I bring it up is because it happens in multiple different forms over and over again for the rest of the text. And when that happens, we need to pay attention to that. He's emphasizing something. He's not just saying, I want these people to get credit. He's saying this, tell them I love them. It's amazing. Verse 10, Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, sends you his greetings. And also Barnabas' cousin, Mark. Which Isn't that an awesome way to describe an author of one of the four Gospels? He's Barnabas' cousin. He says, about whom you received instructions. If he comes to you, welcome him. And also Jesus, who's called justice. These are the only fellow workers, etc., and etc. Now notice in verse 12, Epaphras, who is one of your number, a slave of Jesus Christ. Again, see, we're getting back to the same words he used for Tychicus. A slave of Jesus Christ. Send you his greetings. 
always laboring earnestly for you in his prayers. I love that. Friends, we have people in this church whose only reasonable expectation of ministry is prayer. And they might be thinking this, I don't work hard in the church. I don't serve in the church. All I do is pray. That's wrong. Paul says this, he earnestly works in prayer. He labors earnestly in prayer. So those of you who feel that you don't have much to contribute, pray, pray, pray. And then he goes on, he says, Luke, the beloved physician, in verse 14, sends you his greetings, and also Demas. And then in verse 15, he commands them, greet the brethren who were there. All of this is simply to remind them that they share this ministry, this calling, this mission together. And then finally, he gives us a concluding concern. Look with me, friends, at verse 16. When this letter is read among you, have it also read in the church of the Laodiceans. And you, for your part, read my letter that is coming from Laodicea. Say to Archippus, take heed to the ministry which you have received in the Lord that you may fulfill it. We must never forget the relationship between our assurance and the word of God. As we devote ourselves to the reading, studying, and celebration of the word of God, our hope of glory deepens. So what should we do with the word of God? We should read it. Now, listen. We have an advantage over every other human civilization in history. We have the easiest access to the word of God of any human culture in history. Not only do we have multiple translations in our language, which is awesome, but we can get our Bibles on our phone for free. And you can read it when you're standing in line at the bank, when you used to stand in line at the bank. You can read it whenever you want to. Do you realize people died for that? Do you realize just a couple of hundred years ago, you could be put to death for having the Bible? Now you can have it on your phone for free. It's awesome. Read the Bible. Paul says to them, read this letter I wrote to them and have them read the letter. Can you imagine having to travel to a different town to get one book of the New Testament where now you can get all 66 books of the Bible on your phone for free in 30 seconds? But that's what they had to do. So they poured over it. I think familiarity, beloved, breeds contempt. And now the Bible is so easily received that it's more sadly neglected. Read the Bible. Those of you who committed to reading the Bible through in 2020, are you going to make it? Are you on track? Good, you still have a month. If you do two and a half books a day, if you start today, you could still make it. It'll take hours, though. But maybe some of you are just, you're almost there. Finish. Then start over again on January 1st. For those of you who are following a different plan or timeline, have you been faithfully reading the Bible? If not, do it. Read the word, share the word, love the word. My dead preacher of the year is John Newton, and he said this, I am a weird human being, guys. 
This year in 2020, I picked one dead preacher, John Newton, and I tried to read as much of his stuff as I could. I've loved it. This is what he said. Nothing is wanting that is lacking in the Bible to make life useful and comfortable, death safe and desirable, and to bring down something of heaven upon earth. But this true wisdom can be found nowhere else. If you wander from the scripture in pursuit either of a present peace or a future hope, your search will end in disappointment. This is the fountain of living waters. If you forsake it and give a preference to broken cisterns of your own devising, they will fail you when you need them most. Rejoice, therefore, that such a treasure is put in your hand, but rejoice with trembling. Remember that this is not all you want, unless God likewise gives you a heart to use it aright. Your privilege will only aggravate your guilt and misery. It's a fancy way of saying this. Beloved, you have the Bible in your hands, on your shelves, on your phone. So to neglect it, to leave it unread, to leave it unloved, is a greater sin for this generation than any other generation in human history. Read it. Love it. Celebrate it. Share it. And then when you're done reading it, read it again. And then finally, Paul says this at the end of the book in verse 18. He says, I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. See, this is here on purpose, guys. What does this tell us? This tells us the whole rest of the book was written, what? By somebody else's hand. Paul is not by himself here. So at the very end, he grabs it, and he may have had issues with his eyes, so he grabs it and he writes his own greeting at the end. But this is just to remind us that he's not acting alone. He's part of a team. And he says this, I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. Remember my imprisonment. Grace be with you. And then the book of Colossians is over. So what I'd like to do this morning is one final review of the book of Colossians. I'm going fast because this part might take a little time. A final review of the hope of glory in the book of Colossians. And here's what I want to do. I want to start way, all the way back at the beginning and let's hit the highlights of the whole book. And my hope and my prayer is that you understand it better than you did 17 sermons ago. And again, if you don't, don't tell me. Tell somebody else. I, it would, you know. But if it really does make more sense, go ahead and let me know. That would be beneficial to me. A final review of the hope of glory. Starting in chapter 1, we said this. The conversion of sinners drives us to pray for those who have the hope of glory. Look in verse 3. We give thanks to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. What? So that you would get saved? No, because you're saved. Verse 4. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love which you have for all the saints because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. So we saw the first thing was that seeing sinners come to know the Lord Jesus Christ drives us not to stop praying for them, but to start praying for them, that they would realize this great hope of glory. The second thing we noticed in chapter 1 was that the supremacy of Christ is the guarantee of the hope of glory. If somebody asks you, how can you be so sure that when you close your eyes on earth, you will open them in heaven? Here is the answer. Verse 13, for he rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. He is the image of the invisible God the firstborn of all creation. For by him, all things were created, both in heavens and on earth, visible, invisible, etc. All things were created through him and for him. And he's before all things. 
We see that Paul erupts into this almost hymn of praise, just saying that his hope of glory is the overflow of his relationship to Jesus Christ. And the third thing we saw was that the schemes of the world try to plunder the hope of glory. And in the Christian church, we still see this, where somehow, in some way, the church begins again to be about these rules, man-made, external, secondary rules. And it robs us of our hope of glory. Remember, we talked about the fact that legalism robs us of the hope of glory. Formalism robs us of the hope of glory. Ceremonialism robs us of the hope of glory. And heresy robs us of the hope of glory. Look at verse 4 of chapter 2. I say this so that no one will delude you with persuasive argument. Verse 6, therefore, as you've received Christ Jesus the Lord, walk in him. That is, you receive him by grace, walk by grace. In the second part of chapter 2, verse 8, it says, see that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception. According to the tradition of men, according to the elementary principles of the world, rather than according to Christ. In verse 16, it says, Therefore, no one is to act as your judge in regard to food or drink or in respect to a festival or new moon or a Sabbath day. That's a Thanksgiving verse right there, isn't it? No one should judge you about food or special days. You should memorize that on Christmas Day when you feast again. And as you're laying half asleep in your chair with a button or two unbuttoned perhaps, And somebody walks in and goes, are you going to do anything the rest of the day? You say, don't act as my judge when it comes to food or special days. That's that's free. That's bonus. Then we found out that the focus of our lives reveals the hope of our glory. In chapter 3, verse 1, it says this, Therefore, if you've been raised up with Christ, keep seeking him, the things above. Set your mind on heavenly things not earthly things. This shows us that our hope of glory is real when we delight more in what's coming than what we have. When we focus on his glory rather than our own. And then the very last thing that we noticed was that the relationships of our lives express our conviction for the hope of glory. The way we parent, the way we work, the way we interact, that is what expressed to the world that we're different from them. How we submit to authority or how we exercise authority shows the world how we experience this hope of glory. So let me ask you this. Do you have this hope of glory? Over the course of 17 sermons, we've unpacked this assurance in Christ, this absolute certainty that Jesus is real and that Jesus is mine. Do you have that? Is Jesus your hope or is Jesus your I hope so? Is he the foundation of everything you are trusting in? Or do you just kind of hope it'll all pan out in the end? Ultimately, it doesn't matter if you've read the book. It doesn't matter if you've heard the book preached. If it's not yours, it doesn't benefit you. Are you convinced that the message of the gospel is true? Are you convinced that you are a sinner and the only hope you have 
is that somebody holy will take your, your place. Are you convinced that the message of the gospel is necessary? Or do you think we're all pretty good people? It'll all work out. Oh, beloved, there are so many people in hell mourning the phrase, it'll all work out. Is this yours? Secondly, do you love the hope of glory? Now, if you answered yes to the first question and you have this hope of glory, let me ask you this. Are you absolutely enraptured by the greatness and truthfulness of this hope of glory? Or is it just kind of meh? Does this belief have any real impact on you when you think about Christ? Or any impact about how you feel about legalism, formalism, ceremonialism, or heresy? Does this have any impact on how you treat your spouse or how you treat your kids? The whole book bears witness against you. If you have these things and don't love them, And one final question. Will you pursue the hope of glory? If you answered no to the first question, you said, I don't have the hope of glory. Are you prepared to lay down the idols of your heart and pursue this hope of glory? In order to receive what Christ has done for you, you must put down what you are clinging to. You cannot juggle gods. It is the one true God at the expense of all your false gods. Or it is all your false gods at the expense of the one true God. Are you prepared to repent of your rebellion against the Lord and pursue this hope of glory? Are you prepared to receive the Lord and to give your life to the celebration of this hope of glory? Are you prepared to renounce your self-sufficiency and share this hope of glory? If you're here this morning or you're listening online and you are not yet a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, you've never received him, you've never asked him to save you, the very saddest thing in my heart is that you will hear the word preached and hear it preached and hear it preached and it will have no effect on you. Now, now is the day to respond. It's the time to give your life to him. Or else the entire book of Colossians will bear witness against you. And understand, I don't say this with condemnation in my heart. I say it with mercy and pity for your soul. Now is the time. And may the work that we do, the devotion of our hearts, and the collective results of this ministry be ever and only to the praise of his glory. Let's pray. Oh, dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the team of people that serve you here. Thank you, Lord, for the, the congregation, for the leadership, for everybody who works together as part of your calling here. Lord, thank you that teamwork is the method that we must pursue, we must employ in our ministry to each other and to the world. Lord, I pray this morning, if there is someone here who does not yet know you as Lord and Savior, maybe in their mind, religion is just a personal thing. Lord, would you change their mind? Would you grant them life? 
Lord, would you give them the wisdom, the power to lay down their idols, to wave a white flag in their rebellion against you, and to simply ask you to apply the death of Jesus Christ to their account so that their sins would be covered, so that their lives would be saved. And Lord, for those of us who have this hope of glory, would you stir us so that people can see it makes a difference in us, that it's not just a formal thing, an external thing, but it's real. Lord, would you forgive me for the errors of the last 17 sermons, whatever they are, and that would you please allow the people to understand this book better, to feel its indictment upon them if they refuse it, and the encouragement on their hearts if they receive it. Would you please continue to stir Calvary Bible Church to be, to continue to be, and to become a unified, Christ-exalting ministry to the praise of your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.